Hello, everybody. Hi, John. Hey, John. Nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. Yeah. It's really uh, good it's We're going to, yeah, I'm going to probably wait about maybe four more minutes. Sure. Yeah. Whatever you, whatever you want. Great. And then we'll start and I'll just, if people come in, I'll, I'll bring them in. Um, I thought we could do, John, is I'll just do a quick introduction. And then we'll just have a conversation, you know, maybe it lasts 45 minutes, 50, whatever. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, I really appreciate you being here with us. This means okay. a lot. I'm, I'm happy to do that. I mean, I do have great. something prepared to say. So, I mean, it's great. Whatever. We're very flexible. But it doesn't take the whole time by any means. So, there'll be plenty okay. of discussion afterwards. It looks like besides some people here in Duluth, I've uh -huh. heard that we will have some faculty and students joining us from three or four different colleges or universities. So that's nice. That's good. Yeah. I thought you'd all be glued to your TV screens watching Trump, but evidently not. <laughs> well, I'd rather watch you then. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh Usually have to take a few aspirin after I watch watch him, but sure. Yeah, it was posted for 10 a.m. So I assume most of the people will probably be coming in between 10 and 10.05. I think if it's okay, John, maybe we'll just start about three minutes after 10.
Okay. Um, you know what, John? Um, why don't we get started? I'll do the introduction. Sure. Uh, we're just ready. Okay. Why don't we get started? And then, um, yeah. And also for the people that are here, this is going to be recorded so we can share this talk with other individuals and groups over the few weeks. So I'd like to welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Tone Lanzillo. And on behalf of the Worldwide Teaching on Climate and Justice, which is sponsored by Bard's College um, Graduate Programs in Sustainability, I'd like to welcome you to this first of four Zoom talks uh, with climate justice. And we were looking for four writers, authors, voices that we thought had a very important message to share in regards to the climate crisis, climate change, and John Foster is definitely one of those very important voices. Um, very happy to have John with us today. Um, John is the author of the book Realism and the Climate Crisis. And John is also a freelance philosopher and honorary teaching fellow at Lancaster University. So I'd like to welcome you, John. Thank you, John. Um, right, well, uh, hi, everybody. Uh, Thanks for coming along. Um, <clears throat> I had sort of prepared, well, a kind of a, a, a lecture, but um, I guess um, uh, we're, we're a more select group than a lecture would suggest. <laughs> so it's kind of a, I mean, over here it's tea time. It's four o'clock in the afternoon where I am. Um, uh, so I guess it's kind of a talk around the tea table. I, I will float a few ideas. Um, and then let's let's uh, kick them around a bit, and and I can go on to you know some of the things I have to say later, uh, just as it develops. I have um, tried to send everybody a link to, to the book which Tone just mentioned um, in the chat. Has that come through, or not yet? No. Ah, there we go. Uh, I obviously hadn't pressed the right button. I'm I'm not very good at Zoom. Sorry, <laughs> you have to excuse me. Okay, so um, climate and justice. This this series of talks and activities, uh, I understand, goes under <coughs> climate plus justice. Um, and I want to introduce some of the ideas in, in that book, Realism and the Climate Crisis, um, by juxtaposing those two concepts, climate and justice. But um, I want to do this in a way which I expect you won't be expecting, um, and that is instead of arguing that our responsibilities in relation to climate change and its consequences are best understood as obligations of justice, which is now very much the standard story on both sides of the Atlantic, I guess. Uh, I'm going to suggest that to grasp those responsibilities properly, we need to contrast them with the kind of obligation which justice imposes on Indeed, we need to contrast them with, with moral obligation more generally. And if you want a slogan to, to keep in mind, to give you a fix on what I'm going to be suggesting, it's this climate change is not a moral issue. It's much more important than that. Um, now, what we can agree on to start with, I hope, is that if climate change was a moral issue, it would be a matter of justice. I mean, if you just think about this in relation to yourself, each of us, I guess, on this call, as right-thinking Western folks, would probably accept that we have some kind of responsibility to reduce our individual carbon emissions. Each of us ought to be looking for ways to alter his or her lifestyle in more carbon-neutral directions. But that, that can't be because your own personal carbon emissions do harm. To anything or anyone. I mean, here's some good news, which might come as a bit of a surprise to some people, that you don't have a carbon footprint. The whole carbon footprint discourse is a corporate contract. It's a sort of blame game to shift the focus from system to individuals. Actually, even Mr. Bezos playing with his toy spaceship doesn't have a, a, a carbon footprint. Think about it. A footprint is made when your foot presses down on something and your carbon emissions, however large they are, don't press down 
They don't themselves impinge causally on anything or anyone specific. Atmospheric carbon dioxide just doesn't work like that. High carbon lifestyles warm up the planet or contribute to warming up the planet because billions of people worldwide are indulging in them, egged on by capitalism, of course, to do so. And your particular contribution, or even that of Mr. Bezos, are on that scale so vanishingly small, so independently inefficacious, that they can be said to make no difference. I mean, you know, if you or Perish the thought Mr. Bezos became a naked hermit tomorrow, the planet wouldn't notice. And if you push that thought, it becomes an interesting question whether any unit less than roughly the whole world has a carbon footprint. I mean, does the United States have a carbon footprint? Clearly, it contributes a significant portion of the global emissions total. It was something like 26% last time I looked. Um, but clearly no specific damage which global warming does can be attributed to just those emissions. That's not how it works. Now, the absence or the drastic reduction of those emissions would certainly make an identifiable difference to the speed of the warming process or severity of its cumulative effects. So here is a real, albeit a very generalised, kind of harm to which you as a citizen, I as a citizen, we're each contributing our might. And so we could say that, you know, you also, we also have a citizen's obligation to take a fair share of the hit, which would be involved in national emissions reduction. But by now, with the concept of fair shares, we are already talking about an obligation of justice. As I say, if it, it is a moral issue, then it has to be an issue of justice. If your carbon contribution matters morally, um, that can't be because it's harmfully large, but it could only be because it's unfairly, that is, unjustly large. So it could be unfairly large for the kind of reason I've just glanced at, uh, as against your fair share of a reduction in damage-intensifying damage national emissions, or it could be too large uh, compared directly with, say, your individual fair share of the world's remaining carbon budget for keeping global warming, global warming within, you know, 1.5 degrees C above pre-industrial levels, if only that was still possible. Um, but on either of these ways of thinking about it, your obligation to cut back is indeed an obligation of justice towards future people. And it's this kind of understanding that I want to question, I want to get us to think about and challenge. One thing to be clear about, um, and this is something which is often overlooked, is that you can have obligations. You can find yourself bound to certain courses of action without the constraints in question being obligations of justice or indeed of morality more generally. I mean, think of a parent's obligations towards a newborn infant, for instance. It would seem very odd to say that what is owed to a newborn infant by way of care and love, uh, what is wrong with neglecting or maltreating them has anything at all to do with justice. And it also feels strange even to say that you have a moral obligation to love your kids. Surely what binds you here is a much deeper bond. One, as I say, not moral, but more important. Um, maybe we can pick up on this. I'll come back to this maybe later on. Now, of course, you can have obligations of justice towards a child, as, for example, to hear what your small son has to say in his defence before stopping his allowance for breaking the window, for example. Now, what has changed from when he was an infant? Well, clearly, he's not just grown into the capacities of being able to break windows, but he's now joined you as a member of a community of justification, someone who can offer and be offered reasons. You know, you shouldn't make me pay because it was an accident. Well, yes, I should, because you should have been being more careful. He's thereby become someone to whom you have an obligation of justice, not just to hear his account, but to treat him only in ways which can be justified by an appeal to reasons. You know, you wouldn't want other people to act care carelessly around your stuff. 
various fancy forms of this idea get labeled contractualism in um, philosophical moral theory, but the principle is quite a general one. We're on the terrain specifically of justice when action has to be based on the chance of a fair hearing, where that in turn means a hearing where they can advance reasons for their action, which they could reasonably expect others to accept as good ones. But if an obligation of justice means one based on the possibility of a fair hearing for reasons, then we can't have such obligations towards future generations. They can't participate with us in any community of justification for the obvious reason that they aren't yet around to do so. Now, of course, it is possible to put this point into crude a form, and then it looks implausible. If we say something like, well, we'll emit as much planet trashing carbon as we like because we can leave you lot who aren't here to protest to pick up the tab, well, that would very evidently be an unjust rule of action because everyone can see that no one, past, present or future, could ever reasonably be expected to accept it as a basis for action. <clears throat> I mean, in general, I'll do what the hell I like because you can't stop me is not going to be accepted in any form of justification because it isn't meant to be a justification. It's a naked assertion of power and contempt for others. But what about the kind of thing which is much more like the sort of dialogue we would have with future people if we could? What about we will maintain our present high carbon lifestyles with all the associated benefits, which of course, you know, you future people will inherit. But at the same time, we'll rely on carbon capture technologies being rolled out at scale in time. Just to pick an example from the current, uh, a, re a very recent uh, policy announcement by our own dear British government over here, um, to prevent, you know, in time to prevent uh, our present lifestyles from wrecking the planet further down the line. Could we reasonably expect future people to accept that? as a basis for our present actions? Well, now that's a much more finely balanced judgment. I guess. But here's the point, Hopefully we, that is present people, get to make it. And we're obviously interested parties. A genuine community of justification concerned with achieving genuine impartiality and assessing reasons has to allow for at least the fallback possibility that in such contested cases, everyone likely to be affected can have a say in what's going to be counted as a good reason. And that possibility just is not available in the case of supposed justice towards future people. So to, to bring this back to the personal level, if, if I say I'm emitting more carbon annually than would give future people a fair chance of a decent life if everyone like me went on living like this. So, you know, that's the sort of judgment which might yield the feeling that one had a personal obligation of justice to cut back. That's actually a conclusion depending on a whole raft of assumptions about you know, what mitigation technologies are going to become available, what major shifts to renewables might become plausible, what forms of adaptation are going to be feasible or become feasible, and indeed also about what sort of lifestyles future people are going to want or to find acceptable. But only people who are considering in the here and now whether they should accept such an obligation are in a position to recognise, discuss, accept or challenge those crucial assumptions. And that means, I suggest, that any such obligation could only ever be accepted, whether by an individual or a national community, as a pseudo-obligation. Now, what I call a pseudo-obligation is one for which how constrained you are by it turns on how much constraint you are prepared to impose on yourself. It's a bit like accepting that I owe you money, but I deny you any say at all in the terms or the period or, <clears throat> or the currency of repayment, a situation in which the notion of owing can be seen to be doing no real work. And in this light, it should be found completely unsurprising 
that whenever such pseudo obligations, those endorsed in the Paris Agreement, for instance, threaten to become inconveniently pressing, they're reinterpreted or recalibrated so as to give us a slightly longer lease on doing what we like. And that's been the essential history, has it not, of national and international climate policy for decades. And don't say, as otherwise respectable writers in this field actually have tried to say, that, ah, but we can appoint guardians or representatives or similar to speak on behalf of future people so that they can, after all, have a real voice in these contested judgments and decisions. Yes, it, it's true. We, that is, present people, can indeed appoint such officials. Um, and we must also decide when they get to speak, within what kind of institutional arrangements they must work, just how much attention we're going to bind ourselves to pay them. So, I mean, such a portentous charade just doesn't avoid the difficulties about over genuine impartiality as between participants in the community of justification, which I've been outlining. I mean, it just makes them more glaring. Okay, so contestability is the issue. And contestability under a different aspect is what gets in the way, I would suggest, of other models on which climate responsibility might be claimed to be an obligation of justice. Models which try to make it into an intragenerational rather than an intergenerational matter. So consider, for example, the idea that your present level of carbon emissions is unjust because you're enjoying it as the beneficiary of a civilization with historic responsibility through the industrial revolution and the subsequent development of a global fossil fuel economy. Um, for sea level rise is now threatening the livelihoods of people in low lying Pacific islands and elsewhere. People um, and places with historically very low carbon contributions. You owe these people, it is supposed, not future people, not non-existent, still only potential people, but you know, people who are actually here and vocal and vigorously pressing their clothes. You owe them a duty to move along with everyone else in the West to a much more slimmed down lifestyle maybe so that the civilization which has warmed the globe can now make over to them a huge fund for mitigation and adaptation as a kind of reparations almost as would be due after an unjust war. Now, this does all sound persuasive if one says it quickly enough, but the prospect of operationalizing it opens up a vast can of worms. I mean, on whom exactly does this duty of justice fall? Why? On governments as currently representative of the countries which have done the damage, but, you know, they didn't authorize it, even authorise its continuance. And moreover, they only have funds to transfer to anyone by taxing, directly or indirectly, you and me. On corporations, which go on making obscene profits out of the consumerism which is driving the warming, they only do so because you and I and millions like us, including some inhabitants of the threatened areas, buy their products. Or on you and me as individual Western consumers and taxpayers. But can you really, in justice, remember this is about obligations of justice, can you be held accountable for the actions of your forebears in industrialization and initiating the fossil fuel dependence, which in their times, before global warming was even a, a glint in Svante Arrhenius's eye, were universally acclaimed as progressive and benevolent development? Now, of course, none of this, I mean, question expecting the answer, no, I don't think we can be held accountable. Much. None of this is to deny that Western countries may have obligations of benevolence or of simple decency towards places and populations threatened with climate-driven disaster. And individual citizens will have corresponding obligations to play their part in ensuring that their governments act decently. This is obviously not a negligible requirement, but Equally, and this I think is the key point, it's just not the kind of requirement that we should be looking for here. Intuitively, our class
that related obligation should reach much deeper than a duty of particular mitigation or funded adaptation or cooperative firefighting when disasters actually arrive. Surely our real climate responsibility should be much simpler, more straightforward, less debatable and much more exacting than any such duties of justice could possibly be. The whole problem with obligations of justice is that to get any real purchase on action, we have to be owed by some clearly defined agent or constituency of agents. Is there a, rather a lot of ambient noise? Is that it's not me, is it? No, we're fine. Took care of it. Uh, okay. Um, they have to be owed by some clearly defined agent or constituency of agents who are behaving or were in danger of behaving unjustly to some other equally clearly defined group who are going to be done out of something to which they're entitled and who have a corresponding claim to a hearing on how this is to be avoided. And that template just doesn't fit the climate case in general. The climate case always presents us with issues at whatever level we think about them, which are thoroughly and almost indefinitely confused and contested. And our responsibility in respect of the climate, our responsibility as individuals living in this time, in this age, should surely be a responsibility in hearing in us, not as members of this or that constituency or nation or generation as against such other groupings, but just as human beings considered in the context of the living world of which we're a product and a part. So obviously what I've said so far is by way of critique, um, and I'm suggesting that, you know, your own climate responsibility or responsibility to cut your carbon emissions and shape your lifestyle accordingly isn't a matter of justice arising in any of the ways we've discussed. Um, that leaves open the question, obviously, what it is a matter of. For that we do wrong by complicity in a way of living which is laying waste to the earth, should I take it remain starkly evident to each of us. If it isn't a moral wrong, however, if it is to recall something more important than that, if you don't harm anyone or anything specific by your emissions, and if you don't really owe a duty of justice to any identifiable person or group to mend your ways or just to improve your ways, what sort of an obligation do you have to what you owe it? What sort of wrong is involved in neglecting it? Now, I have positive things to say answering those questions, but I guess, you know, given that we're a, a small group and this shouldn't be too much of a lecture, perhaps I'll just stop there and we can have some discussion, maybe prompted by what I've said already, because I don't expect by any means that everybody will agree with it. Indeed, I hope you won't. <laughs> I did have some questions um, presented to me already. Um, for those of us that don't only just write about climate change, but are organizing around climate change, was very intrigued by your concept of the vanguard. I wonder if you could just share a few things about who or what is this vanguard uh, to move the dialogue or the conversation forward? Well, um, interesting that you should go straight to that question. I mean, that that rather anticipates what I've just said that I would say later. Um, but uh, very quickly, I think that um, <clears throat> what I call the vanguard are people who have recognized their actual climate responsibility, um, which is not, which is, which is mis misconstrued, I think, um, on, a on a moral or a justice template, which is something much more in your guts. It's, it's a sense that this civilization, um, in the way it is travestying life, 
both life at large in the living world and life as it manifests itself in, in you as a creative agent. This civilization is just intolerable and has to be got rid of. Um, and people who have got to that recognition find themselves confronted with a choice. You know, you can't, if you've once seen that, go on just cultivating your garden. You want to do something about it, you've got to be some kind of revolutionary. Um, and that is, it is, that's essentially the, the vanguard idea. I mean, you recognize vanguard from, from previous revolutions. Um, the idea of the, um, you know, the Leninist vanguard. Um, I've drawn on a bit there. Um, but that does all depend on the recognition that this is about, not about justice, not about moral obligations. It's about being able to live with yourself if you remain complicit with this civilization. And if you find you can't, what do you do? And what, what do you do in conjunction with other people who can't? Right. Because of course, it's very, very late. Um, that's an absolute context of, of anything I've got to say about this. The climate emergency is desperately serious. Um, and conventional politics seems helplessly incompetent to cope with. Um, so something beyond conventional politics, and that perhaps also means conventional democratic electoral politics, has now to be invented by the people who recognise the, the extent of our problem. And those will be a minority. This is a point about the vanguard as well. There's a revolutionary vanguard minority. Because think about it. To recognize the, the state of the emergency that we're actually reached, you need to be intelligent enough, you know, to understand what the scientists are saying. You need to be reflective enough to apply that to your own condition. You need to be imaginative enough to, you know, have a vivid picture in your mind constantly of what's going to happen, because this is all, you know, further down the line. Um, I mean, I, yeah, it's not quite as far down the line in some places as others, if you believe that the sort of freak weather that people are experiencing, and I, you know, I guess over there, as well, not just in Australia. Um, if you if you take that to be climate driven, um, but you know, general collapse, which is what will happen if the feedback loops really kick in, is a lot further down the line. You have to be imaginative enough to make that real to yourself. You also, as well as those three virtues, you have to have honesty to not kid yourself about happening and not kid other people um and you have to be brave enough to put yourself on the line now people who combine those five virtues are um well there, there are a good many of them but they're not a majority and we haven't time to wait for them to become one so i mean i've i've, I've rabbited on a considerably more probably than i should have done in answer to tane's question but um no thank you that kind of um, anticipates a bit what I might say later. <laughs> Another thing that came up is a lot of people talk about hope. Uh, and there's been different definitions of hope. And you have a very um, intriguing perspective. And you have a phrase in your book, you call it the creativity of transformative hope. And maybe could you just share a few thoughts about that? Okay, so... If we're going to hope to turn this around, this emergency situation, and I'm talking now, as it were, I take it to a small community of people who, who you know, 
belong to my vanguard who recognize and you know have all those virtues um if we're going to turn this round our hope has to be pretty strong to keep us active um but it also has to be realistic um and if you look at the odds you know the empirical odds the chances of turning it round in the time available, given how long we've fossicked about not doing very much, and given how vast and global the, the problem is. Um, if you look at it as well, dispassionately and empirically, in terms of you know calculating the odds, there isn't much hope. And if you say, well, we have to hope in order to go on acting, that's kind of what I call in the book chocolate cake logic. You know, it's like saying, well, of course it can't be too fattening because if it was too fattening, I might have to not eat it. Um, now, you know, you can confront a chocolate cake like that, but not the climate crisis. So the sort of hope you have to rely on is hope that we can change the odds by not giving in to that kind of empirical, empirically justified despair, not being daunted by the odds, is potentially a way of changing the odds. That's what I mean by the creativity of transformative hope, which is a you know rather polysyllabic and pompous sounding phrase, although it works better in a book than it does on a Zoom call, I guess. Um, but that's what I mean. I mean, if you if you refuse to be daunted by the odds, if enough people refuse to be daunted by the odds um, and go on hoping anyway, that hope can actually change the odds. Hmm. But, and there's a crucial qualification. It needn't be, it mustn't be utopian hope. It mustn't be the hope that not only can you change the odds, but you can have everything that in an ideal world you would like. You can have um, the sort of individual liberty, the sort of democratic structure, the sort of, um, you know, the kind of liberal, free democratic society that we've been used to, and a society which is in a, enables itself to accept and impose the sort of restrictions that are going to be necessary on, on individual and crucially on corporate behaviour um, to, to claw the emissions back in time to stop disaster becoming catastrophe. Because that's actually where we are. We're not going to stop climate-driven disasters happening. They are now loaded into the system. And we can see that, you know, beginning to, 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 to come through. We're in the terrain, we're on the terrain of maybe being able to stop disaster turning into catastrophe. And that means, you know, <clears throat> hope in those con conditions goes with recognizing that there are no win-wins anymore. There's no hope of, you know, doing it all. Um, the phrase of Naomi Klein sticks in my mind. You know, we want to turn um, corporations uh, and their trillions of oil-based profits around democratically and without a bloodbath. It ain't going to be that simple. Hmm. Um, I have to ask, in your life, what, yeah, where did your interest in writing and talking about the climate crisis begin? Um, it began a long way back. Um, we've had in, in Britain um, since the late 1970s, um, an organization, a political party, which is now called the Green Party. Um, it used, when I it used to call itself the Ecology Party. Um, 
which was rather quaint, um, but you know, it did make a certain kind of sense. Um, and that, you know, that, that took off after the oil crisis of the early 1970s, after the uh, limits of growth report of 1972. Um, it was initially very, very small. I mean, it's still pretty small. Um, it now has one member of the UK Parliament and quite a lot of people at local government level. Um, and I got involved in that um, because I was interested in these issues and saw that something had to be done politically. Um, and, um, and then when I realized that this wasn't going to happen through the ballot box, after having, you know, given quite a lot of my life over, over a good many years um, to uh, try to make it happen through the ballot box. And uh, I, I then thought, well, maybe we need to uh, examine the ideas that lie behind this. Um, and so I ended up um, thinking and writing about it, it, which connected to, you know, my own academic and intellectual background. So um, I, I think of myself as, a, as a, an intellectual activist now. I don't, I don't go out on the streets and on the knocker very much, if at all. Um, I would call myself an armchair member of the Green Party. Now, if that didn't sound too energetic, I'm more like a hammock member, um, <laughs> but uh, I, 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 you know, do it up there. <laughs> right. Um, as you know, writing about doing research, organizing around the climate crisis um, can be very difficult and challenging. Um, is there anything out there that inspires or motivates you to continue what you're doing, whether it's through your writing or speaking? Um, well, it's changed over time, actually. Um, when I started writing and, and, and um, you know, trying to, to write serious books about this stuff, um, as I hoped that um, there would still be a kind of conventional political solution. Um, I'm not sure I believe that anymore. I think if there is a solution it's going to have to be as I say revolutionary um, and what I what now keeps me going um, well two things um, one I am as you can see um, getting on in years and uh, I've got things that I want to say before the chopper falls um, which means I have to get on with it um, but the other thing is I've now got grandchildren um, and when I think about what their lives are going to be like when they're my age, if, if we don't manage to turn this thing around, um, well, I, 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 I shake, um, I, I quail. Um, that's an important motivation now, is actually, mm. because future generations are, as it were, here already um, in the sense that by the time those little lads are my age, you know, in the in the 2070s and 80s, um, it's going to look very, very bad if we can't do it. Very bad. Yeah. Um, Does anybody have any any thoughts or comments on the critique of the justice-based? Um, model of climate obligation climate responsibility which i was which i was offering earlier i'm quite interested to hear any feedback on that um i mean i i make the case in the book and i i've kind of summarized it uh, as, as as cogently as i can for this kind of forum but i'm always in because you know in the, the standard the standard model um, which is reflected in the title of this of this series is you know this is about is about justice this is about um, obligations of justice to whoever um, 
and uh, I'd love to hear what people had to say about that. Yeah. If I could, I had a, a thought. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Michaela. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Um, good morning <laughs> from LA. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's good afternoon. Good here afternoon too, so. over here. <laughs> Trying <laughs> to caffeinate up here. I, I take your point. <laughs> um, so I was kind of thinking about um, the development theory, modernization wow. theory, and as that kind of correlates to dependency theory. Um, so with those three theories kind of in mind, um, and this knowledge that we kind of have now that our actions do affect a uh, disproportionate, like South, uh, global South, right? So my purchase of this, even though I use it, is something that probably I don't need. Um, so I was kind of thinking about that with um, the kind of intersection of this, what is it, effective altruism kind of thing uh, with Peter Singer, how he writes about this knowledge that we have that we are disproportionately affecting the global south with our actions how does that kind of play into your idea of it's not about justice well i mean it, you know interestingly you you brandish an artifact um which you you say you didn't need but you know you bought any um the fact of the matter is that you're purchasing that absolutely no effect on anybody. Um, <clears throat> this is a point I'm trying to make about the carbon footprint. I mean, the same is true about, you know, uh, air miles. It's true about uh, long haul flights. Um, you know, these, these generate carbon emissions. Uh, yes, indeed. And the carbon emissions all tot up. But it's not, as it were, as if anything you do or don't do is actually going to make any identifiable difference. There's nobody out there in the global South who is going to suffer or not suffer because you do or don't do something. Um, if it's an obligation of justice, <clears throat> it has to be on a very, very much larger scale. It has to be, as it were, intergenerational. Um, and my, my question is whether the justice template works when you get it to that scale. Um, because, you know, one can say, oh, yeah, I shouldn't, I shouldn't fly. I shouldn't take this flight because, you know, um, I, I, because of the carbon emissions associated. You can be like Peter Thunberg, you know, and decide to sail across the Atlantic instead of flying um, and very, you know, very commendable too. Um, but that's not actually going to deter people when they feel they actually need to fly. Um, and very often people have, you know, reasons, genuine, genuinely moral reasons, you know, love miles when you have to go and see a, a sick relative on the other side of the, well, in your case, the other side of the continent. Um, for, for me, you know, somewhere somewhere uh, further away than, than the coast of this little island. Um, you're not going to not do that, actually, um, if, it, if push comes to shove, because you, people are going to know that those emissions aren't aren't hurting anybody. Um, so that model, if you like, well, in, you know, it makes a, it looks like it makes a case. It doesn't grip. Um, and someone like Peter Singer um, is trying to push it harder than it will, will, will push, I think. He's trying to, you know, well, as he's done throughout his Career. He's trying to make um, uh, things into moral obligations that don't really work as moral obligations. I had a follow up to that. That sounds, that sounds negative. Um, and it, is, <laughs> it, is, it is negative in, in relation to that template. Um, I mean, I do think we do have kinds of obligation which, which grip us very seriously. 
a couple follow ups of <laughs> sorry. Not to, be, not to be captured on a justice. <laughs> um, so first follow up to that, I was kind of wondering if like the development and modernization is in your eyes benevolent, malevolent, or indifferent. Development in terms of like uh, the modernization theory, where um, we're kind of on this jet plane taking off, right? And we're not really set to like demodernize. We're just kind of in the air all the time, going, uh, progressing in a way, developing, progressing, um, but not really de-progressing or de, you know, kind of settling down at all. Uh, that kind of model is that benevolent, malevolent, or kind of indifferent. Um. Well, I think um, anything which applies the term progress to what humanity is currently doing to the planet can only be malevolent um, because um, it, when you think about the extent to which this civilization, you know, shreds and tears apart the living world, um, the extent to which it shreds and tears apart the sense of life and creativity with individual people. Um, there's no word but malevolent for that. Um, and calling it development kind of begs the question. Um, because development sounds like a good thing. You know, it's good to develop. You know, you get bigger, you get stronger. If you're a plant, you flourish and that kind of thing. But it isn't. It's it's degeneration, not development. Perfect. Cool. <laughs> so then I was wondering, um, these small scale changes uh, with, with regards to a maybe carbon footprint or... Uh, let's talk about maybe fossil fuel, um, burning of fossil fuels, synthetics, uh, things like that. So small scale changes, like if people change their diet, say maybe more plant-based diets for more people, um, is that maybe something that is kind of a, I don't know, justice oriented uh, change that could be applicable to the climate crisis? Well, I yes, nothing that I say it was meant to suggest that people shouldn't be looking for ways to reduce their own carbon commitments. OK. Um, but the reason that you need to do that is because if we are actually as a, as a society going to turn this around, there is going to have to be very severe restriction on what individuals can do, can purchase, can spend, can how they can travel, what they can eat. Um, and as it were, it's a good thing to prepare yourself for that um, because it's coming. Um, and to the extent that that is about reducing your complicity in a, dis, in a life destructive system, that's something very important to do. But that's, that's, if you like, the positive side of my critique of justice. If we think of it as, um, if we think of these uh, reductions and, and changes in lifestyle, which we're all obligated to as um, discharging obligations of justice. Because those obligations are so squishy, we're going to, you know, when push comes to shove, we're going to just do what's comfortable. That's human nature. Um, if we as um, enabling us to be less complicit in a viciously destructive life hostile system, then that might feel different. So yeah, I mean, people have got to people have got to 
change a lot. Um, you know, even people like us who've probably changed a fair bit already are going to have to change a lot. But, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Connected to justice, that's, or is that uh, not connected to justice? No, that's that. I, 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 and I think it is in the sense that it illustrates the point that I started off by saying I was going to make, which is that we have obligations. But if we think of them as obligations of justice, we maybe misconstrue them. And they maybe bind us less. Um, because actually, when you start questioning, well, who's this obligation to? Who am I potentially harming? Um, how do my emissions get bound up in, in all this, this total process? Um, the obligation kind of um, drifts out of the window. But if it's an obligation to make sense of your relation to a system which is viciously destructive and has to be changed, that's a different kind of obligation. It's an obligation essentially about making sense of your own life. And that's, that's ultimately what I mean by saying it's not a moral obligation or obligation of justice. It's something actually deeper, more important. And that, that's the case that at considerably greater length, um, I argue in this, in this book, which uh, the link to which I've put in the chat. Cool. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for those um, questions. That, that's, that's helpful. Um, anything you'd like to close or share with us, John, towards the end of our talk this morning? Or um, Well, let me come back to the point about, um, about revolution. Because this is, a, you know, it's a scary concept. Uh, it's a cruel, it's an uncomfortable truth if, if it's the case that the only way to be properly climate responsible at the stage we've reached is to become a revolutionary, you know. And there's an awful lot of discussion that would need to be had on revolution strategy and tactics. You know, how on earth is this actually going to be achieved and what's the vanguard role in it? Um, but, you know, revolutions have got... <laughs> We've got a lot of history. Um, there've been a good number of them. Um, the ones in the past have all been driven by considerations of morality or of justice. Um, and they've always historically ended up in different forms of injustice or indeed different forms of tyranny. There's a quatrain by my favorite poet, W.B. Yeats, a little vicious little four-line verse, which goes, hurrah for revolution and more cannon shot. A beggar upon horseback lashes a beggar on foot. Hurrah for revolution and cannon come again. The beggars have changed places, but the lash goes on. Um, you know, that's a long established human dynamic. Uh, but this revolution, if it happens, won't be driven by that sort of lethal jockeying for advantage. It'll be driven by life responsibility. <clears throat> and that will be something wholly novel in human affairs. We've never had to do this before. We've never in the past had to confront the putting of life into worldwide jeopardy as we're now doing. Not you know, as with the thermonuclear standoff because of the risk, through the risk of a Holocaust that we devoutly don't want to happen, but through something which humanity is consciously and deliberately, perhaps albeit insanely, driving forward. Um, it's, it's an unprecedented kind of transformation, um, which those of us who recognize that responsibility have to have to drive forward. Um, right. right. 
so that's yeah that's, I'd, I'd like to end on that note i think um and, sure. and um what i'd like to do is i just want to kind of wrap up with a quote from uh, john's book that i've used in several conversations quote hoping against hope in the face of our unprecedented crisis has to mean hoping that one's agency can somehow make a difference against all the odds and the kind of self of which that could be true, the self with that inner relations to responsibility, undaunted in its exemplary action by any hesitation over the rationality of its likely impact is forged in the very same stock. Because to trust oneself in such active hoping is to release the life energy which creates its possibility, unquote. I want to That's thank right. you. I, I, I couldn't have put it better myself. <laughs> um, I really appreciate you being with us, John. We will share this conversation with others. And thank you. Um, look forward to staying in touch. Indeed. And thanks, everybody, for joining and for your contribution. Thank you. Take care, everybody.